Hello, and welcome to our week on the limits of liberalism in British North America. We've been looking for the past number of weeks at a series of social and political questions, some of them related to religion, to evangelicalism, and we were seeing kind of new possibilities for the freedom of women, of indigenous people, of African Americans. Uh, we've also been looking at broader reform movements. We've been looking at electoral reforms in the, in the colonies in, in Upper Canada and in Nova Scotia. And we've also been kind of generally on this road of what you could call an expanding civil society, of, of democracy unfolding, of a, of a democratic tent being built that more and more people are being brought into all the time. And so in general, that kind of creates a picture of a, of a, of a time period when, when democracy is becoming strengthened and, and brought forward to what we imagine to be a democratic society in the 20th and 21st centuries. That's true. And it's an important story, and we'll continue to talk about the evolution of democratic society in the 19th century. But there's also a lot going on around that, of people not being brought into that tent. Um, certainly we're seeing that with indigenous people. Uh, certainly we're seeing that with women. Women are not granted the vote until the 20th century. Um, certainly we're seeing a kind of complex picture with African American people, because while not formally disbarred from voting in the way that the way that women and indigenous people were, uh, often didn't meet the property qualifications to get the vote. So there's all kinds of complications about that liberal story, about that tent unfolding. Today, we're really honored to be uh, in a significant historical location in Canadian history. We're in the British Methodist Episcopal Church in St. Catharines, Ontario. And this is a really important center for some of the great stories of Canadian history. Of course, Canadians are very proud of the role Canadians played in the Underground Railroad, of being a welcoming location for African Americans fleeing slavery in the United States in the years up before the Civil War and during the Civil War. And so this is a very important location because many of those, uh, many of those Underground Railroad stories originated uh, in this church, originated with people who were associated with this church. And that's really kind of what we're looking at this week. We're looking at not just African American stories, we're looking at a series of people who are not being brought into that tent but people who used institutions of civil society or churches, and oftentimes the churches were the, kind of the center of those civil society organizations, and they used those civil society organizations as a way to advance their political agendas. So this week, for example, some of your readings allow you to look at uh, women in New Brunswick uh, successfully campaigning uh, through their church organizations for temperance legislation uh, in New Brunswick in the middle of the 19th century. We're also looking at residential schools uh, for indigenous people the complex story, and we'll talk about whose civil society is being, uh, is being deployed there, uh, but again, you see the kind of the institutions of the state there being used not so much to advance these people in many ways to, to, uh, to, to, to control them and contain them. But we're also looking at, uh, not in St. Catharines, but in Halifax, but we're looking at other African-American organizations. We're looking at, uh, in Halifax, the African uh, Refugee Society, and we're looking at the later creation of an African Abolition Society. Uh, two civil society organizations, both associated with uh, Baptist and Methodist churches in Halifax, and how they're trying to integrate themselves into a larger reform politics. They're trying to show themselves to have an interest in important political questions of the day. The abolition story is one of the most important stories of the 19th century. It's a story that's central to an emerging democracy, an emerging sense of liberalism and freedom in the 19th century, and often told in a kind of heroic fashion where, and unfortunately in many ways told about where we, white people, helped free those unfortunate black people. Um, as we'll see in the story today, African Americans played an important part in that story them, themselves. They were driving forces in that story, often not allowed to participate as fully as they might have, been, might have wished to, and certainly the Sutherland article that we're reading this week shows us something of that. But we certainly get a sense that they were trying to participate. They were trying to step up, trying to show their interest in it and their capacities to govern themselves and to govern their own behavior. This church is really significant for that kind of story because it is an African-American institution. It's an institution that prided itself on being part of the community, of the black community. In Halifax, the black churches uh, consistently try to maintain a separate institutional footing away from the white churches. It's not because of a chauvinism, it's a defensive mechanism. It's a, way, it's a way of saying, these institutions are our institutions. These are institutions that allow us to flower, to allow us to participate on our own terms in this story. And that makes them very, very important institutions. 
the other institutions we're looking at this week, the temperance campaigners in New Brunswick, um, they too are people who are outside that tent trying to find a way to make political change, trying to affect political change. And again, using the church, using those institutions associated with the church as a vehicle to go forward. The other trickier element this week is the story of the agricultural societies. These are not an oppressed group. These are white, middle-class men from Nova Scotia in the middle of the 19th century. And I think what's interesting about them is they too are using institutions of civil society, the agricultural societies, these, these clubs that exist in communities all across the province and exist here in Upper Canada as well and in Lower Canada. Um, but they're using them really to put forth their own claims on the larger politics. They already have the vote. They are already influential members of their communities. Uh, they're actually using these organizations to advance a stronger case. But again, we see this em emerging debate, this location of democratic reform in the mid-19th century in these institutions in civil society.